1Q84. Now check this bad boy out. Okay, this is probably the thickest book I own. Okay, this, this bad boy can probably stop a bullet. Probably. All three books into one. Now, of course, this, is, this has been my experience reading this behemoth of a novel. Um, of course, it's interesting. It's mysterious. The characters are good, right? For about six or seven hundred pages, you know, I'm interested. I'm hooked. I want to find things out. Um, I'm immersed in the daily routines of these two characters, Tango and uh, Aomame. But this is what happened to me. At about the halfway point, so this is about six or seven hundred pages, at the halfway point, I suffered some fatigue. 1Q84 fatigue. At the, at the middle, I had to put this book down. I was a bit tired. I wasn't feeling it anymore. Right? And then I picked it up. And at page 1000, yet again, this exhaustion occurred. You know, I was a bit tired of this book by this point. And I had to put it down again. Okay, and after that, it became a chore. And when I had a couple of pages left of the last chapter, I was praying, I was thanking the universe that it was finally over, which is a shame because this is not a bad book, not at all. But it ha it lacks a couple of things. Okay, in in my view. Okay, listen. Let me say it this way. There has, been, there has always been this cliche, this theory, this hypothesis that, you know, it's better to show than to tell, right, when you're writing a book, a novel. And I, I, I disagree completely. In this case, with 1Q84, I really wanted to find stuff out. I was interested. I wanted to unlock the secrets. I wanted to understand the, these mysteries. I wanted to be informed, you know. In this case, with this book, uh, we don't find anything at, out at all. At all. Which is a shame, because I wanted to find things out. The basic, the gist of it is, you know, these two characters are transported into a par par parallel world called 1Q84, and there are two moons, the usual moon and a smaller, greener one, right? And then we have this cult, and then we have these little people, right? And, and let's just say that certain shenanigans happen, okay? There is a, a little bit of supernatural stuff going on, and nothing really is revealed. And I guess, I guess the answer is that we, we are in a para parallel world, where things happen outside of logic, right? Therefore, it is what it is, right? But I wanted to know certain things. What the hell is going on with, the, with these little people? Okay, because when the little people <coughs> finally show up in the book and they exit the mouth of that little girl, Tsubasa, you know, that was a moment when I was hooked. Okay, I wanted more, because I was invested, right? But there is no revelation to anything. Not even hints. Maybe you've discovered certain hints about the little people. Where do they come from? What's, what, what's their deal? You know, upon which rules do they operate? They, they, <coughs> they weave these air chrysalises and they 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 basically clone people right the the mazda and the whatever the other thing is called right and the question is why you know they they had this cult has a leader and 
the little people are in, are you know they're they they are they have an investment in this leader of Sakigake of this religious cult and my question is why it it is never explained nothing is ever explained right and you might say that maybe the mystery is what hooks you what hooks you in what makes you an addict you know which is why this book should be so good but in my case in my experience it isn't so okay i wanted i wanted some answers what what are these little people all about where do they come from why do they enter why do they come into this world through the mouths of of people or dead people or dead animals goats why you know because apparently uh, some sort of tunnel is formed some sort of portal gateway how why why do they come here what's their deal what's their end goal you know what's their mission what do they want okay never really explained it, it's a damn shame because they're they they have this they're a bit sinister this these little people are sinister they have powers they're eerie they're bizarre and i like that and i wanted more from them you know and <clears throat> murakami <coughs> does this thing in the book later on where maybe two characters have a discussion and and and, and murakami puts a little people, a little person there, and the little person usually goes like ho ho or he he. They laugh or they <coughs> chant something, right? It, it, it's ominous. And, I, and I'm reading this and I'm wondering, what does this mean? What does this entail? Is this an omen for something, right? What's going on? What What is Murakami insinuating with these little people when they're giggling like that? Ho ho ho, he he he. It, nothing really happens okay and by the end of this big ass book we we have absolutely no answers with the little people apparently the little people are extremely upset that aomame killed the le the leader of sakigake the cult and they have this thunderstorm and they're angry blah 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 and nothing really happens you know there is no result there is no conclusion to this they're just upset and apparently they have these uh <clears throat> strange powers to get rid of people but they can't touch tango or aomame only the people around them which is you know yet again i have to ask the question why is this this needs to be explained upon which rules do they operate uh, you know that allows them to hurt the the acquaintances of tango and aomame but not tango and aomame directly why you know, maybe it's the answer is extremely simple for the sake of plot convenience, right? And I guess this is my my one gripe when it comes to this book one Q84. You know, there there is absolutely no explanation to anything other than these two protagonists, Tango and Aomame, are transported into a parallel world world and uh in order for for them to you know reunite right and it, it, there is no real payoff the the payoff if you want to call it that is it's banal it's lackluster it's lukewarm right it should be romantic i guess but i'm not i'm not invested at all in 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 their relationship in in them reuniting right <clears throat> and here is here is why i suffered from so much fatigue and exhaustion while reading this book <sighs> murakami does this thing in this book where we follow these two characters tango and aomame and this is the problem they're interesting characters you know sometimes they're even fascinating they're not one-dimensional okay murakami does some good character work here character development etc but after a while we are left with 
chapter after chapter after chapter after chapter of following these two characters' daily routine. And what I mean by that is, you know, they go grocery shopping. They, we are told again and again how they prepare their simple meals. You know, we are told again and again, repeatedly, repeatedly, you know, that Aomame is, you know, she does her stretching. She's uh, into sports. She's extremely athletic. And <clears throat> we, we are also told about what kind of meals she prepares. Again and again, chapter after chapter. Tango goes to the cram school to teach his, his lessons. Then he might go to a bar. Then he might talk to Komatsu or Fuka e Eri. And then he goes home. And he doesn't like the fact that people call him at his home. You know. And we are told how he prepares his meals. And then he goes to visit his father, which is in a coma. Again, again, this happens for chapters after chapters after chapters. He goes to the cat town and his father is in a coma in the sanitarium. And he goes there and he, he goes and he stays at an inn. And he goes and he talks to the nurses. And then he goes out to drink with the nurses and... They drink this, and they talk about this, and then he goes to the inn, and then he goes to visit his father again, and this happens for so many chapters that I'm absolutely perplexed. You know, I'm, 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 it, it, it is an overdose, an overdose of minutia, of miscellaneous nothing, okay? The, in my opinion, right? <clears throat> and there was this, this big thing that I was interested in when it, come, when it came to Tango, because... His father was a weirdo, right? He, and, you know, his mother died early on of an illness, and Tango has this vague memory of his mother uh, cheating on his, on his father with another man while Tango was a baby in the same room. And then later, way later, we find out that his mother didn't die of an illness. Uh, she, he, she was strangled to death by this anon anonymous nobody, uh, Right, and Tango never really finds out, and his father dies, and I guess basically his father isn't really his father, right? So Tango is a bastard, maybe, but there is no real. It's it's extremely vague, right? And then we have Aomame, and sh and she goes to the safe house, right? And she day after day, chapter after chapter, looks down at the swing set because Tango might show up. <laughs> Right, and she does all of her stretching, and people come in and bring, uh, you know, uh, groceries and stuff. And chapter after chapter, she stays and she looks at the swing set, and she fiddles with the little uh, uh, gun that Tamaru gave her, and she, you know, uh, puts the gun there and takes the gun and cleans the gun and and cocks the gun and removes the safety, and and there's a bullet in the chamber, and then. Uh, she she puts the the safety on, and this happens. It, it is a pointless, senseless repetition for so many chapters that it is mind-boggling to me, at least. To, it's monotonous as all hell. Okay, which is a shame because these two characters, these two protagonists, are absolutely intriguing, and I feel like Murakami doesn't do a lot with them. You know, after. After 700 chapters of, of getting to know them, you know, I would say that I, as a reader, I'm, I'm getting a bit tired of following their daily routine, <laughs> which doesn't really change ever, okay? It's too much pointless, senseless information, you know, blasted repeatedly, right? Aomame never uses the gun, of course. Uh, Fuka Eri just disappears, just like that. She was an intriguing character. She just goes away, right? Komatsu, also, he was a really interesting character. And then he disappears for who knows how many chapters. And then he pops up and uh, he gives a little explanation as to what happened. And then he disappears and that's it, right? I mean, what happened to Fuka Eri's uh, 
guardian, Professor Ebiso, he just fucking disappears, right? And then, at the end, our two protagonists finally reunite after 1,300 pages. 1,300 pages, and they reunite, and it's kind of, it's kind of, uh, meh, in my opinion. And then they go back to the year 1984, they leave 1Q84 behind, and it finally ends. And, uh, Aomame is pregnant with a little one, and that's about it. And the question is, is that little one an actual little person, or is it a, a normal human baby? Right? No explanation whatsoever. <clears throat> it, it is a supernatural, immaculate conception. Right? And it's vague as, as all hell. Right? When you start reading this book, you think that the that this cult, Sakigake, and the people involved are absolutely important. You're gonna find out some crazy shit. You won't. You won't. And you and you think to yourself while while you're reading, oh boy, this leader, this mysterious hulk of a leader, the leader of Sakigake, he has some powers. He's he's interesting. He's a mysterious char character. He is not one dimensional. And then Aomama kills him, and that's it. That's it. We don't find anything. You think that you're going to find something out. You think that you're going to discover more as to what led to all of this. Why the little people picked this guy. Absolutely nothing. You're not going to find out, find out anything. Right? And you think that maybe Fukaeri, there's something with her. She's off. There's something off about her. She's odd. She's quirky. Right? You think... You think that you're going to find out something. You won't. You won't. Even though she's an interesting character. You, you know, M Murakami doesn't do anything with her. Right? And then we have... Tango's papa. And... And, uh, and Tango's papa. He's really... He really stood out to me because when Tango finally visits him at the sanatorium before his papa goes into a coma, you know, Tango asks him, you know, am I really your child? Because he has always suspected that his papa isn't his papa, and his papa tells him you are nothing. And that's that that's crazy. That's 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 a cold line. And you think there's something to this, there's something more than just the fact that Tango is a bastard. And you think, you know, you're going to find out something. You're not going to find out anything about anything. Because this is what Murakami does in this book. He sprinkles really interesting things here and there. Like seeds. And you think they're just going to grow and they're just going to blossom in the, into this crazy forest of intrigue and secrets. And oh boy, oh boy, it's not going to happen at all. At all. Never going to happen. After 1,300 pages, there is no real development, no real answers to anything. And that, that was, a, it's a shame to me, because this book has a lot of good qualities, and Murakami chose not to do anything with them, right? <clears throat> and let me tell you, after about 1,000 pages, you know, for 1,000 pages, we get the POV chapters of Tango and Aomame, and then in the last volume, volume three, which happens in the winter, uh, guess what? We get another POV, you know, chapter, or chapters, I should say, from this character called uh, Uchikawa. That's right. For some reason, we're going to get POV chapters from this nasty-ass character, Uchikawa, right? And when I first read the first chapter in the last book, I was, I was perplexed. What's going on here? Okay, now let me tell you. <clears throat> I was actually getting some sympathy and empathy for Ushikawa because you really find out more about him. You know, he, 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 he isn't a handsome person. He's kind of ugly, right? People don't like him because he's ugly. He's deformed. 
right? Let's just say that physically he is a inferior specimen, but he got he got that brain, he got that talent, he got skills, abilities, right? <clears throat> And you find out more about his past. You know, the, he had a wife, he had kids, he had a house, and something happened. We don't really find out what really happened. Uh, his wife lied about her age, I guess. Maybe she cheated on him, but they had a, a separation. No explanation whatsoever, right? And I wanted more from Uchikawa. But here is what Murakami does yet again with this character. Just like with Tango... And Aomame, he does exactly the same thing with this character, Uchikawa. In his POV chapters, we are told again and again, chapter after chapter, repeatedly, what he does. And what he does is he does research, he goes into an apartment, and he puts a camera, and he takes pictures of people, and he... Uh, he has Tango under surveillance, and he takes pictures of everybody, and he goes to the store, and he buys stuff, and he sleeps in a uh, sleeping bag, and he eats from cans, and point the same pointless information, again and again, senseless, meaningless, chapter after chapter, okay? There are bits and pieces to U Uchikawa that are so interesting. And Murakami wastes all of this potential with regurgitating this pointless information. What he does, he goes to the store and he buys cans of food. He go, he 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 <clears throat> he, he does this surveillance all day long, and then he goes to pee, and then he goes to shower, and people shower, and he Murakami t tells us how these characters shower, and I'm just it, it's it's exhaustion. Uh, it, it's exhausting to, to read all of this for 1,300 pages, okay? Um, <clears throat> and here is, listen, here is how you know that a, 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 a novel is good if a novel is appealing, if a novel is a masterpiece. A book is, is good if the reader wants to reread it and re-reread it again and again. And unfortunately, I will never read uh, 1Q84 ever again. It's too much. This book has no right to be this thick. We did, we did not need three volumes, okay? Two, even two, no, two volumes were too much, okay? This book does not deserve to be reread again. Unfortunately, I will never touch this book again, which is a shame. Okay. I will not think about this story again. I will not think about these characters ever again. Although they're interesting. If if Murakami put more effort in, a little bit, if he cut out all of the senseless re repetition of pointless information and focused more on the characters and on the plot, you know, maybe I would have reread this book, okay? But I will never read it again because I'm not gonna <clears throat> think about these characters or these situations that happen in the book. I'll never touch this book again. I'll not, I'll never think about this again, ever, okay? <clears throat> and listen, this is, this is a bit of advice. All of you aspiring writers, all of you amateur writers, okay, you have to read this book in order for you to understand what you shouldn't do, okay? This book is a massive lesson, okay? If you are an aspiring writer, if you're just starting out, you need to read this book from cover to cover so that you do not make the same mistakes as Murakami made here. Okay, this book is an example as to what you should not do. Okay, listen. If you have the balls as a writer to produce such a brick of a book, okay, look at this thing. Okay, if you have the balls to write such a massive book, it has to be, it has to be, more than this in terms of plot and characters. It has to keep you engrossed, immersed. And at times I was just like, oh my God, listen, bro, listen. 
After the halfway point, I was praying for this book to end already. I, I could have finished this book two weeks ago, three weeks ago, and I was dreading to pick it up again. If you're going to write a, a, a tome as thick as, as this, you should do better. Okay, this book is a lesson. This book is an example. Try harder. Okay, and, and this, this is a, ba a basic rule. Okay, you know, stop it with the repetition of senseless, pointless information. Okay, every book has a bit of mundane trivia. It is fine, but, but, but chapter after chapter for 1,300 pages, that is unacceptable, my guy. That is unacceptable, playboy. Okay, unacceptable. Do better as a writer. You know, cut down on the pointless regurgitation of senseless information that deals with, with the average, with the ordinary. And let me tell you, I wanted to love this book. I wanted this book to just mesmerize me. I wanted this book to carry me. Okay, I wanted this world of 1Q84 to be spectacular. I was hoping for it. I was praying for it. And it did not happen. Haruki Murakami did not deliver. Okay? Did not deliver. In my humble estimation. And I know that uh, <clears throat> that uh, there are a lot of Murakami fans who just cannot find any flaws or defects in his books. And it, that's fine. You know, after reading, listen, after reading... Most of his major works, like, you know, After Dark, uh, Blind Willow, Sleeping Woman, Dance, 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 The Elephant Vanishes, um, Norwegian Wood, South of the Border, Sputnik Sweetheart, The Wild, uh, Wild Sheep Chase, The Wind Up Bird Chronicle. I've read all of these. Okay, these are his major works. And with the exception of Norway, Norwegian Wood, which I will always confess is his best work, the rest of his work aren't, isn't my cup of tea. Okay, listen, Murakami is just not my cup of tea. Okay, he's a good writer, but, you know, it's whatever, you know. If Murakami is your special favorite writer, that is excellent. That is superb. He's not mine. You know, and I wish that I would have fallen in love with his work, but I just can't because to me, it's it's not that, it, it, it's not, let's just say that in my view, Murakami does not produce absolute uh, masterpieces. And what is my definition of a, of a masterpiece? Most of all, a literary masterpiece should haunt you, should haunt your waking moments, and when you go to bed. A book should haunt you. That is how you know that it is a good, tremendous, right? And as I said previously, 1Q84 will not haunt my waking moments and my sleeping hours. I will not think about Tengo and Aomame and Fukaeri and Air Chrysalis and little people and two moons, right? It's it's unfortunate because, listen, listen, it's unfortunate because every time I pick up a new book, I just want that book to just carry me into into a world of absolute magnificence, right? And every time I'm disappointed by a book, I'm just like sad, depressed. It's unfortunate, right? And I would say this, listen, listen. If any other writer, okay, and I hope nobody's offended by what I'm going to say, but in my humble opinion, if any other writer with no fame, no reputation, a nobody, if a nobody writer produced the exact same book from page one to page 1318, you know, this, it will not get, it, <coughs> it wouldn't get published. Okay, if if anybody else that isn't Haruki Murakami produced a, a book exactly like this one, it would not get published. Okay, publishers, editors, 
publishing houses would not touch this book. It, they would not touch this book. Okay, listen. I had to self-publish myself because publishing houses would not touch my stuff. And I know how they operate because I have experience. Okay. They would not touch this book. But because it is... It has Haruki Murakami's name. He has a reputation. He, he is an extremely uh, favorited and beloved author. Okay. And that is why this book gets a pass. If anybody else produced the exact same book, it would not get published. Period. I know what I'm talking about. And hopefully nobody will be offended by, by this. It's just an opinion. If I produced 1Q84 and not Murakami, it would not get published. Because let's just say it's a bit too long and there are parts that are extremely subpar, mundane, right? Banal, even. Anybody else that produces 1Q84, it would not get published by a publishing house. It would not get touched by literary agents and editors, okay? The only reason this book is acclaimed is because it is a work of Haruki Murakami, okay? And listen, I'm going to end it with this. There is a quote on the cover. It says, and I quote, a work of maddening brilliance. A work of maddening, maddening brilliance. And I would say I disagree completely with that statement. Absolutely. It's a good book, but that's about it. Maddening brilliance? <laughs> nope. I don't think so. Uh-uh. You know, anybody that is honest, that is earnest, might agree with me. And I and I don't mean to offend anybody. This I'm not trying to insult Haruki Murakami fans. It's just the truth. Okay? This work is not... does not have the quality of maddening brilliance. Like, no way, Jose. Okay? It's, it's a good book with a lot of flaws and defects. It could have been astounding. It could, if Maybe it could have been even a masterpiece. Okay. It could have been... Maybe it could have been a, ma a masterpiece. Maybe it could definitely be uh, improved upon, elevated, you know, polished. Not to perfection, but close to perfection. This is not a work of, of maddening brilliance. It's, it's just... A good book with a lot of flaws, and it it has no right to be this thick. Look at this. This bad boy probably can stop a bullet. It has no right to be this thick. Okay? But that's about it. If you enjoy this content, if you want to support your boy, I got a few books on Amazon. The link will be down below. Okay? Unfortunately, Haruki Murakami is not my cup of tea, and that's all right, okay? Each to his own. Uh, you know, keep on reading good books, and uh, that's about it. See ya.